Welcome back, everyone. This is episode five of the Weekly Juice Podcast. My name is Ryan Levelacqua. I'm joined alongside here my co-host, Corey Jacobson. Today, we're going to talk owning your own business and managing your time through real estate. And uh, before we dive into things for the episode here, Corey, what's new, man? Yeah, man, not much. Um, uh, just to give people some some reference point here, it's the end of April and golf courses just got allowed to be reinstated in PA. So um, that's something that we're, I'm at least going to be trying to do over the next uh, couple of weeks. I think May 1st, they said it, it'll be back. So, which is pretty cool. Uh, I know Rise, <laughs> Rise are a really good golfer, right? I'm say, I've seen you on the links, dude. You should stay quarantined. <laughs> First of all, it's been, that was two years ago when you and I shit up the course at wherever we were. It was a joke. You've been practicing? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. Um, right. Yeah. But – so today's, I mean, I'm super excited about our, this episode today because our last episode, we had our first guest and we actually, we have our second guest today. It's a really funny story how they, uh, our guests and, and, and me, like how we reconnected. I'm going to get into that in a couple minutes and talk about him. I just wanted to throw some opening, some opening thoughts in before we get started, but you guys are going to love, you know, his journey and, and just some of the things that he talks about here. Um, I, I, one of the things I want to talk about, and just to reiterate, I was thinking to myself before we started recording about this show, and I wanted to share like the number one reason why I love this financial independence movement and the real estate journey specifically, uh, you know, just as it relates to why we even started this in the first place. I, I kind of like to relate back to why our why and, and, and the reasons why we thought that this would be a good idea for people to hear. And it's, it's, uh, it's just an interesting perspective that I have on it because it, I truly feel like this financial independence movement allows someone like me, who I don't consider myself to have an incredible skill set at all. I, I consider myself to be pretty normal, but somebody without an, an incredible skill set to live an incredible life. That's what this that's what this financial independence journey does. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I personally know like phenomenal athletes and phenomenal actors personally, that are superstars at their craft. And they're going to live, live this like absolutely crazy, different, amazing life from like normal people that work nine to fives. And because of their, this magnificent skill set, like I know 16 year olds who are guaranteed to be making multi-million dollars in the NBA that I've coached in the past and that I'm currently coaching and their lives are going to change forever when they hit that pinnacle. And it's like, they're going to live this like fantasy life because of their skill set and their dedication. And it kind of draws me back to like this fire movement. And in my opinion, it's the common man's opportunity to live this outstanding, fulfilling life that's far from the norm. And you don't have to be a genius or like this incredible actor to do so. Uh, so I just think that's like kind of the whole power behind it. And again, freeing up your time to do things that you love and not having to show up and, you know, be a slave to your job. That's kind of how you get to this amazing um, life that I'm talking about. But um, yeah, so I just think that that's like super powerful. Uh, and one of the other things that I wanted to mention right now with just like something currently that's going on is that I, during our, our a couple episodes ago, I talked about people were curious about the type of research that I was doing because Rai, I think you asked the question, like, what are you doing right now during the quarantine that's, you know, helping you prepare for when it's lifted in, in terms of real estate. And I just wanted to talk about one of the things that I was doing is I'm actually going through a, a refinance on my primary residence and the interest rates dropped. So I'm currently refinancing my home. That was part of the research that I was doing. I'm getting like 1.5% per uh, APR lower than what I originally paid on my home like a year and a half almost two years ago when I purchased it so by doing that type of research I'm probably going to save maybe somewhere between 40 and 60 thousand dollars over the life of my loan which is which is uh it's pretty good and right you went through a refinance recently too didn't you I was about you? to say where'd you hear about that core actually you I heard about it from you which was awesome and like that's just kind of some of the things that this like 
time stop is giving us where it's like, okay, how can I set up my future and my payment's going to go down? Like your payment went down, right? So mm -hmm. those are the things that I'm starting to see within the market where I think it's going to have this, I don't think real estate's going to dip really, but it's going to be this leveling out period. And that's kind of why you're seeing these interest rates uh, drop, right? Yeah. 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 I think, um, I mean, the market could do a number of things, right? We're not experts here. So we got to see how long this thing plays out. Yeah. But um, I think it's time to reset and take advantage of things while you can. You yeah. never know. Interest rates probably going to go back up at some point here. So yeah. I think we both got really low ones for, uh, for the time and taking advantage, right? Yeah. And we got lucky too, which is like just part of it, but just something to think about for people that own their own homes or they're looking to buy their own home, you know, in the next coming months, uh, the interest rates are probably going to go back up. But right now it's, if you can do it, if you have those reserves, if you have the down payment, if you have the things we talked about, it's a great time for sure. Um, yeah. So without, you know, going any further, I just wanted to open up with some thoughts. I wanted to introduce, uh, our guest here. His name's Larry Beretta and he, it's so funny. Larry and I went to high school together and Larry started listening to the podcast and out of the blue, I got a text or I think he maybe DM me and he's like, yo, we have to talk. Like, like I, I, the things that I'm doing and the things that you're doing, they kind of align. And it's just really funny. I hadn't, I, I ran into him at a restaurant, like, I don't know, maybe like three or four months ago. And then with the fact that him and I spoke for an hour and a half, I was like, this is what this thing is all about just the network bringing people back together or or meeting new people and and larry is doing some crazy things man crazy in a good way i mean like he has five rentals with his uh with his parents but he also owns his own hockey training business and he's going to talk a lot about how that's freed up his time along with the real estate to parlay these things to be able to live this life that's in his late 20s and doing the things that he wants to do every single day and He's just a good guy on top of that. So that, that's a, that's not a bad thing to have there, but um, you know, without any further delay, I'm going to introduce Larry Beretta. Uh, hopefully well, you can hear us. Larry. I, yeah. That, um, that intro, I guess I'm, uh, I, I got no words for that. That's, I don't that's think that's I've ever good. been introduced before ever. So this was, yeah. this was awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah, uh, I man. think if uh, some of the people used that to I send this to, they're going to be, uh, they won't agree with you on a couple of those things, like the good guy <laughs> part, but um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You talked you talked about a couple of things in the intro where, uh, like we said in our conversation, I just wanted to yell into my into my car speakers to to have this conversation. And even in the intro right there with the the golf, the young athletes, um, you know, the time spending and and uh, in this quarantine, it's uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. So I'm excited to do this. This is something that I've looked forward to for a while now. And uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you? Um, Thanks for having me. I think I got to say that. I gotta absolutely, sure that. dude. Thank absolutely. You. This Thanks is the first here. of uh, this is the first of many times you're being on the show because I want to <laughs> back to you in you know, a year, two years, and see what your journey's like. That's yeah. what it's all about. So I, I think first and foremost, we want to just tell just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I know I mentioned we went to high school together, but a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you got into owning your own business and how you like kind of see real estate and financial independence playing. Yeah it's it's i mean it's it's interesting like the whole story is interesting and um you know it's nothing like super crazy luck's involved but you know obviously hard work but you know we went we went to high school graduated 2010 um went to went to college at penn state berks uh this was right when the whole bubble happened so everybody was going to state schools um you know i might have got into westchester if the the applications weren't if there weren't as many but bottom line is I had like Penn State Berks and that was it well I played hockey so I was like well Penn State Berks has a hockey team we'll go there we were one in 22 our first season so really? like yeah, um, but yeah that was after winning a state title in uh at we didn't win the state title we won the Flyers Cup we went to states and oh, we right. lost and I had like the worst game in my career there so I mean, all right we won't talk about yeah it. <laughs> yeah so but uh yeah one in 22 season and um but you know we I was I loved it here I loved it at Penn State Berks so I ended up staying all four years, and um, after that, I took a job uh, with J.B. Hunt and um, was relocated around, like, central PA, then was over in New Jersey, was hopping around a lot. I did that for, like, 18 months, and then one day, I was just like, this is, isn't what I want to do, and I started coaching when I was in college, just, like, Saturday mornings, helping out with the little guys, and, you know, then <clears throat> eventually, it turned into me giving lessons to some kids, and it grew into this this this, you know, this hockey school 
And one day, like I said, I was just sitting in the, in the desk chair and my shift was 5 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I was like, this, this isn't what I want to do, right? Like I would do this if I needed to, but I have the ability to, to take, a, take a chance, take a risk. And a lot of that is because of real estate. So um, stopped working, J.B. Hunt in July 2016, started Go Hard in August. And I've been going, going strong with that until this quarantine. <laughs> and you can't, yeah. and there's no ice rinks open. So can't teach yeah. kids how to skate. But, um, you know, it's been going well. Um, but a, a, a big reason why, like I said, is because the real estate. And um, how did you I, get, um, so how did you, I have a couple questions on that. Like, we'll talk about the fortitude to actually start yeah. your own business. But how did the real? How did you parlay the real estate? And like, you, I remember you saying on the phone something about how it's almost like you fell into it in a way. It didn't hundred percent have, like, have to do with um the housing. There wasn't yeah. a housing or something, right? So so it's it's so funny because like oh eight, that that whole market crash is the probably the only reason that I'm in real estate and. I wouldn't say I'm successful in real estate, but it's trending that I could be, right? right? Like it, it, I've, I've put in the time and the, and the initial investment, but you know, I didn't do that myself. It was my parents who really did it. And I kind of forced my way into their, their company. So yeah. the way it happened was I, you know, applied for Penn State Berks and, you know, I, I didn't want to commute to 45 minutes from Exton to, to why I'm missing. So, I tried to get a, a dorm and the, the wait list was ridiculous. Like just, you're not on the cuff. You don't have a chance. So I said, mom, I got nowhere to live. And she's like, well, you know, your father and I think that, you know, we want to, may want to make another investment. Maybe it's something where we buy it and you can get the tenants. Well, I mean, you know, we had high school buddies that were going there um, and then other guys on the team. And I was like, yeah, no brainer. We saw one place, um, walked in, walked out. And I was like, well, that's where I want to live. So we, we, we bought the place in July before I moved in. I remember that the, my roommates were like, it's like, is this real? Like your parents are buying a place and we're going to live there. This doesn't seem like it's actually going to happen. I'm like, yeah, yeah like settlements in July, we'll be fine. <laughs> well, we moved in in August. Um, and then after that, two years later, I'm like, mom, there's more guys on the team that need places to live. And there's like 90 some units in this, this condo complex. So uh, they bought another one. And then when I graduated, I'd work all through college, um, like, you know, all odds and ends jobs, whether it was coaching or, or I worked at the bookstore at one point, I don't even know how to read. So the fact that I worked <laughs> at the bookstore was crazy, but um, you know, I, I always was hustling through college and I had some savings. So, you know, my parents were two years again and, and there was another one for sale. So we, bought that had more people that were interested in renting and then another two years 2016 when i stopped doing go hard another one came up for sale and then recently uh back in may 2019 um we bought the one that i'm living in currently now but it's just it like fall on your face lucky in that sense um where you know we we walk into one door where i end up living all four years in college having roommates and then that turns into the condo complex that's helped us build our real estate portfolio. So cool. kind of nuts. You did like the house hacking type of, um, I guess, I guess the, the term that we use where it would really be your parents to start out, but the, your parents bought the place, you paid rent, and then you were subsidizing the mortgage with the other two guys that were living there. Right? Yeah. So, so it's funny because when you, when you guys were talking about that, that's the first thing that I thought of. And, you know, my typically parents pay for the kids rent, right. In college, if, if you're lucky and, and, you know, maybe there's the, but for, for me, I was lucky enough to have my parents pay for my siblings and they kind of hacked it. They said, well, I'm not going to pay rent to some landlord. We'll be the landlord and he'll find the renters. So, you know, day to day wise, they weren't really handling anything. It was, it was me. And I loved it because I didn't have rent or had loans that was going to pay for the rent and years down the line, I had to pay it back. So, um, you know, they hacked the college rental, you know, for say, and then, and then it turned into the business with the second, third, fourth. And, and then like the fifth one here we bought and we're living in, but it was, we're fixing it up, we're getting it ready. And then when we move out, it'll stay a rental. We're not going to, we're not going to sell it. So at what point during the, uh, during the, 
time where your parents were buying rentals, did you jump in and start to partner with them? Was it, it was halfway through at some point, right? You were like, I mean, I always told, I always told everybody that I was the owner, like in college, like, you know, like I was a cool guy in the apartment where they're like, yeah, he owns it. And I was like, yeah, I own it, but I didn't own anything. (laughs) I I just said it. So I always knew I was like, I want to be a part of this. And the second one happened and I was obviously in no way to be able to contribute capital uh, wise. The third one, I had money saved. I had money from, you know, uh, grandparents and um, working stocks that I put, you know, so I had money and I was like, all right, well, I want to invest in this. And then the other one was just, I saved. I mean, you guys talked about some of the the ways to save. Um, You know, I, I started that as soon as I started working. And then I had a nice chunk of change and, and invested that. Um, so it was as soon as, as soon as I saw like two or three months of how it was working where they were paying money and I knew that it was covering costs, I, I knew like, I, this is something that I was interested in. Cool. Um, do you think that this is something that's like reputable, like, um, let me see, uh, replicable, like that other students that are in college can do especially because some of our audience is young, uh, maybe just starting out in college and like a way to get in the game. We've always talked about house hacking as a way to get in the game. Do you think this is something that is, it seems like a great way to create that nest egg for yourself where you're able to save up, up, whether you or not you do it with your parents, you know, that's a whole nother ballgame. Yeah. I mean, there's all different things you can do with money. If, if, and and the the, the kid's probably not going to be able to do it, right? Like the the student's probably not going to be able to buy the property unless he's, you know, had one heck of a, you know, job in high school, but, um, the parents from that standpoint, I mean, if, if you're a parent paying cash for your kid's tuition, then you absolutely could do this because what's the down payment on a town home? I mean, it, it depends on where you're at, but like Penn state main campus, like I'm sure there's a ton of houses that if you're going to pay fifteen thousand dollars in tuition and another six seven thousand dollars in rent the first year then you probably and you're going to pay that in cash which i know that's not everybody's situation but that's probably pretty close to what you would need for a down payment right in some situation now i'm not saying that is there's obviously other costs uh that go into that but yeah this is this isn't this isn't like the only one-off thing and i know that there's other people that i've talked to have done this before um it's funny you say that because a buddy of mine who lives in this area, he was, he, I remember my freshman year, he was like, what, so you own, and then he was like asking me a thousand questions, right? And he's like, well, like, how much did you pay for it? How much is rent? Like questions that other students and friends like weren't asking. Yeah. The next year he had one. Like he bought yeah. the one that was two comp or two buildings over and it's like, well, he figured it out quick. So you know, but his parents were, were well off and, and able to do that. But now he's taken over and he's got more properties than I do. But um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely replicable. Re- cool. replicable. I mean, what do you both. think is like, um, can you paint a picture of what you're like, uh, where you're at today with it? I, I think I briefly mentioned, I didn't know if that was correct about how, how many you own or like what your just situation is with maybe now and what your plans are for the next like uh, yeah. the upcoming future. So um Obviously, it's my, it's my parents and I. I'm I'm the oldest of five, so it's me and my mom and dad are like the two entity or the two people of the company. So yeah, um, they I don't own more majority. They own more, but um, I have ownership in the company, and then the and then the other kids have like their slight ownership as just the kids of the, the of the owners. So um, yeah, from from the plans for this. I mean, I've talked with my mom and dad about getting more ownership through time or, you know, we just continue to build, you know, unit after unit with the same percentage cost. But then I also want to branch out and do something else. Like, you know, we've talked before in that conversation about other areas. So I don't want to invest in Penn State Burks off campus housing and have all my eggs in this basket because if Penn State Burks, you know, one day decides that they're not going to be having off campus housing. I'm in, I'm not in trouble. It's still real estate. Right. Yeah. But my niche is want to diversify, right? Yeah. So I want to diversify. I want to get into something that's a little bit more creative. I mean, this right now doesn't have too much, you know, it's, it's kind of cookie cutter here, like buy the property. They all look the same. Yep. They're, they're, they're all two, you know, mostly two bedrooms and 
they're all the same rent. Like I want to do something that's a little bit different. Maybe in town you're renting to young adults um, who just got started and stuff like that. So um, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, it's something that, I don't really have a true path of where it's going, but you know, you talked about trying to buy one a year or something like that. Yeah. That's definitely something that I think about all the time. We were on that two year plan for a while. Um, but you know, it's things happen like this, this doesn't help with yeah. the situation. No, exactly. Really but it's cool that it won't like mentally derail you. You kind of know. No, 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 no. This is, this is not something that like, I mean, obviously it's scary cause you don't know what's going on, but this wouldn't make me not want to invest in real estate yeah. by any way. By I have any a question. I, 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 um, I was just going to say, Ryan, I didn't mean to shut you out. If you had some questions, you can hey, go. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here, dude. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so quick question. Uh, I'm going to a bunch, but what's the thought of investing through a company rather than um, just under your personal name? This is like something that I don't know. I feel like I hit gold when my parents and I talked about this. Like, Cause technically I'm renting from a company that I own right now. Right. Right. Like the place that I'm living owns this. Uh, the place that I'm living is owned by the company that I own. So I have to rent from myself. Like Tom Petty had a song, be a landlord and a renter. Well, that's yeah. like literally what's going on right now with myself. So it's, it's unique and it's funny because like the business, it opens it up to a bunch of different things. So, so as far as business lending and stuff, I know very little bit, like we nibbled at it with, with the most recent property, but it's like a whole nother world. I mean, obviously down payments are more, um, you know, there's different rules and, and, you know, terms and cr contracts, like you get 20 year loans are probably are more common. And, but, um, <clears throat> you know, personally, you, you assume a lot of risk when you do something like this. So one of the first things that we wanted to do once we kind of settled down, and, you know, we were done buying a property every two years and, and things weren't as chaotic. And I was sort of out of working a nine to five job and I had more time to focus on the real estate. And, you know, one of the first things we said is we need to make this, um, you know, a business, not just us doing something for additional income. So, um, you know, the way that we do it is each property is its own company. So it, it limits the amount of risk because, you know, if something, God forbid, happens in, you know, unit 407, you don't want unit 603 to be on the hook for something that happens. So each, each property is its own individual uh, entity. And then, you know, it's owned by the parent company, which I highly suggest anybody does. If you're going to go and invest and rent, you need to get with the, the way LLCs are now, you need to go. I don't want to say need, cause I know you guys are very suggestive and you don't want to force anything on, which I think is sure. great, but it's a very good idea to get that LLC because you don't hold the liability, which is, it's scary. You don't know what night you're going to sleep and you know, you wake up to something that's awful. You want to know that you're covered and it's not going to, you know, jam you up down the line because you didn't get an LLC. Yeah. By the way, it's like, it's like 50, it can be like a hundred bucks to get an LLC too. Yeah. So. I don't, I mean, I've seen all different prices. Like I think typically we're around four, four fifty. We did a bunch of them at once. So yeah. we got a, a little bit of a discount, but for, for the peace of mind and knowing that you're protected, it's, it's, not, it's the cost of doing business. Can you go into that protection just a little bit for people that aren't too aware? I don't know how much you know. Or how so, I mean, in terms of what, like if something were to happen or, or like how yeah, it's so, structured. Mm -hmm. Basically so, like the, the process of getting one and then also like what it protects you against. So you can go to LegalZoom and get an LLC. That's what I did my, my hockey school with. But I don't suggest that. Go to a lawyer, go to somebody that you're comfortable with or somebody that you know who's comfortable with and they'll draw you up the LLC. I don't know what you know, a lawyer it is that needs to do that, but you go, you tell them, you say, I'm renting a property, um, you know, LLC, you know, I need an LLC for it. They probably do it for any real estate guy. I mean, I've talked with guys that flip houses. They get a company for the house that they're flipping. Right. Like they're, they're that, you just, that's the way that you're, you, you do it because it, it frees it up. So as far as a liability, from my understanding, if something were to happen in one of those units, like a slip that, and fall, you mean a or slip something. and fall, something yeah. like that. Like, I, you know, if something were to happen in one of those units, that unit is the only unit that's on the hook Yep. as instead of, if it was one company that had five different units, it's looked at as, you know, if something happens over here, all of them, 
are responsible. And then depending on the situation, you could lose all of it, which is, that's scary. And then if you're by, if it's under your name and not a company, then you're on the hook for it. So. Yeah. So you're on the hook for it. Like, like if something were to happen in, if, if I didn't have any LLCs, if something happened in on the ice, it could threaten a property I own. Yep. So my hockey school is an LLC. So if anything happens there, they can only come after the company. They can't come after me. So, I mean, I, I don't really see why you wouldn't get an LLC as a sole proprietor now. I, I mean, you sit in business class and they say, you know, here's the different things that you can do if you wanted to start a company. To me now, now that the LLC has been around for, I don't even know how many years, but a decent amount now, like that seems the way to go. You're, you're freeing up liability um, on yourself and then, you know, you're not tying yourself up with double taxation that you get with corporations and I mean, anything that we do, we do LLC. Cool. I think, um, by the way, that's great advice. I, I need to take that advice. I need to have my next property, which I'm already starting to work on. I need to, I need to get an LLC for it um, and kind of create an umbrella policy. But yep. you mentioned in there, you're talking about your hockey school. And I'm just, I wanted to tie this all back together. I mean, you know, Larry talks about all the time how he kind of like, he won't say this, so I'll say it for him, but he kind of broke the stigma a little bit of, you know, he self admits that he doesn't, he didn't go to like an amazing school. He wasn't a, an Ivy league or a 4.0 GPA type student, but he's a business owner and he's a real estate investor through that. Um, so I just wanted you to talk about how, you know, a little bit, talk a little bit about your hockey school. You know, what made you start to decide it again? This podcast is a lot about happiness and freedom of your time. So how does the real estate, uh, uh, you know, give you the ability to have that freedom and invest money into yourself and into your hockey uh, school training school. When I, when I decided to do the hockey school, I never, I never thought like once it became a, a, a possibility, that was what I was going to do. And I didn't second guess it for anything because of real estate. Like if I didn't have real estate, I don't, I probably still would have done the hockey school, but all stress and confidence going into it was because I, I knew I had real estate backing me. I mean, at that point I had uh, a percentage of two properties, right? Cause we, I had the one that we bought when I graduated college. And then I had the one as I was, I was leaving um, JB hunt. So I had two properties that didn't have full ownership, but had ownership in. And I knew like, okay, well, if anything terrible happens, I have my real estate. So, you know, then the hockey thing, it, another crazy, like fall on your face, lucky sort of situation. Now it started like that, but a lot of work went into it. So, you know, when I was playing um, my junior year going into senior year, something around that time, uh, a guy that I worked uh, for just like with goalies, he was training goalies and I was shooting for him. And he said, you know, help me coach the, the younger kids. So I did. And then they started asking for lessons and lessons turned into clinics and, and then it was like okay well I want to start my hockey school now so you know I go from working 50 hours a week 5 a.m to 2 to managing my business the right way where maybe I wasn't making as much money but I was working you know one-fifth of the time so you talk about and, and I'm and I'm living closer to my parents I'm not commuting 45 minutes to work like you know I was when I first started the business I was four minutes down the street and I am now and, you know, I was working what, like an hour, maybe two a day, depending on what ice time was available at the rink. So yeah, weren't you saying, I don't mean to interrupt, but weren't you telling me that in theory, you could make, you could go on the ice and this is just the avenue that you decided to take. You can go on the ice and make, you know, a hundred bucks an hour or something like that and work a couple hours a day. And you're making more than you made, you know, working eight hour days, for, you know, 45, 50 hour work weeks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not every hour you're making a hundred bucks, but anybody in training understands that, you know, that's possible. Right. So, you know, if it's a clinic, I'm, you know, I'm doing better than that, but if it's a solo lesson, I'm not, and it's, you know, it's all give or take, but you know, I could do a, a you know, a team workout and, and go out for a team and they could give me a check for X amount. So, but yeah, it just kind of came down to it. It's like, why am I spending, you know, hours on hours making, you know, even if it was like 21 bucks an hour, uh, what it broke down to in my salary working 10 hours a day, when, you know, I can work one, not make as much, but not be nearly as miserable, you know, and, and like things change when, when I started my, my company, like, you know, I ate at home more. I, I didn't have, you know, I didn't go out and drink nearly as much. I was never a really big drinker. Um, 
yeah, I have my little phase, but you know, it's not like I'm going out and drinking. We all had our little orbit. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows that phase. (laughs) If you're in your late twenties, you go back and you think of that year. That's still in the phase. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, so like that and you know, like little things, I just started cutting and you know, I started saving more money. I was happier. I didn't have the urge to like need to go to the bar on Friday night because I just, you know, was gouging my eyes out from Monday to Friday. Like I was, right. I was happy with what I was doing. So I felt like I didn't need to go and, and give myself entertainment. Yep. Um, and that's what hockey was. Like the reason I really got into it was, I mean, the opportunity, but I remember my dad, like the last day he played football, um, you know, division three and, you know, his jerseys retired at like homing, like unbelievable idol. Right. And how hard he works. Like I can't beat him in basketball today. He's 55 <laughs> years old. And I think this is supposed to be my prime. I won't play him because I don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> so like he emulates work ethic and, and like effort and anything. So whenever it comes to sports, I'm all ears. And one of the, one of the last things he said about me with my playing career is he said, he goes, you know, you kind of already started doing it, but he's like, pay it forward, start coaching, whether it's just with a couple, you know, whether it's with a team or, or an organization that you're helping out, he goes, give back to the sport that gave you so much. And I was like, wow, like that's, that's insane to think about, but like, it's so simple, but give back to it. And that's what I've been able to do. Like I have relationships with families and kids that I would have never in a million years guessed that we would create that kind of connection because, you know, they, they pay me and they support my business to do hockey lessons. Like yeah. that's nuts. Yeah. So it's, it's unique, right? Like somebody listening to this probably isn't going to go start their own hockey school, right? But there's something out there for everyone that they can find that. And, and if they really want it, like you do have to work. Like I work for it. And there's nothing more frustrating than when somebody calls me up and they're like, hey, you know, like I was just thinking like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing lessons like you. And, and uh, you know, just tell me like how you usually do it. I'm like, okay, well, you got three years because that's how long it took me to really get going. Sure. Like yeah. it doesn't just happen overnight. So you got to put the work in, even though I fell on my face lucky, it's, it still was years of, of work and building the reputation. So would you say that the, the real estate that you did, keeping, uh, keeping your expenses low, getting into real estate young, the combination of those things allowed you to mitigate the risk to jump in head first and say, okay, like, you know, you thinking to yourself, Larry, like I, I can go do this because I know how much I spend and I know that I'm supplementing my income through the real estate business. A, a, a thousand percent. I mean, as, as far as living costs, when I was living four minutes down the road, so what am I filling up my tank? Like what, every two weeks maybe? Um, That'd be nice. They were, yeah, they were, um, no, I had, I had friends that were paying the rent. We lived in one of the units. So I had three of my buddies that needed a place to live. They were paying the rent and, you know, I had cable and electric. That was, that was my bills for the week. So, you know, I, and I, and when I was living in and working for JB Hunt, I was working with my uncle, which was a huge help obviously in savings. Right. But I was driving a lot then, like, you know, it was New Brunswick. I was, I was working and I was still coming back to why I'm missing, which was, you know, an hour and a half hour. New Brunswick, New Jersey. Yeah. So I would drive. I'd work 5 a.m. to 2, Monday to Friday. Maybe You're work- driving 100 miles. Yeah, it was 100. It was, it was, and I had a Ford Explorer, and it was trashed by, yeah. by it was done. It was done. So I totaled that in just miles. So I drove from, you know, up in northern New Jersey, drove all the way down the Y missing, maybe hang out with my buddies on Friday night, stay over at their place, wake up Saturday, go Saturday 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., coaching at the rink. Um, for their program, then I'd maybe do a lesson that afternoon, hang out with my buddies at night, go to my parents. And then Sunday, I would, um, you know, go back and, and run lessons. So, so that's how it started. Um, but yeah, I mean, it came with a 100 mile back and forth grind of driving. And, uh, but I mean, I would do it again in a heartbeat because it's, yeah. it's got me. So the about, about, the yeah, I got a couple I mentioned, um, you know, found success in, in a couple different avenues here. First, I wanted to dive in on the real estate. Um, do you view these properties as like long-term buy and hold? Are you basically having them for just cash flow per month or are you guys looking to flip these for a nice profit here um, in a couple of years? Um, for, for me, this, like, this is long-term. Like this is, I don't, I could never see a day that we sell these. Obviously that's probably gonna come, right? But the thought of selling one of these is just not in my head. 
um, it, we, we have one that, that we live in that we bought and we fixed up a little bit, but we're, I mean, typically, you know, they're, they're good to go. You buy them and they're ready to be rented. Some of them might've been rented last year and you're just switching investors on this, or, you know, you're buying from an older couple that, uh, you know, for whatever reason they're selling, maybe they have steps and they want to get rid of them, but you know, their place isn't touched. It's all outdated, but what's a college kid care, right? Like I can right. just charge a hundred less dollars than I would in the nicer unit and not have to put any money into it. And they're yeah. like, yeah, that's fine. I don't want nice things anyway. I don't want to risk breaking it. So, you know, and, and it's all different. You got to know who you're renting to. And some college students do want nice stuff, but yeah, these are all long-term. What I want to do with my, what, what I want to do in the near future. And it's funny, you guys talked about it. Like the, the market, I personally do feel like there's going to be a, a dip. Like you talked about plateau and core. I, I agree maybe overall, but in some certain situations, I believe that there's going to be a dip that some people are going to have a real opportunity to bite on. Yep. And, and that's where I kind of want to make my next move. Now, not coaching right now, not making money obviously doesn't help that situation, but there's, there's savings. There's other things that I have that if I really wanted to take a risk, I could. And, right. and there's, that's what I wanted. I really want my next step, I think is buy a place that needs some work, fix it up, rent it out, refinance it, do it again. Yeah. And of course we talked about that. Like that's one of your visions as well. Like that's kind of like, what, what was the acronym that you had? Yeah. So it's, um, it's called the Burr method and the uh, bigger pockets, which is a real estate there investing network. They the book right it. There, kiddos. Yeah. So there it is. It's a uh, buy rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. So essentially you're buying a property, the you're um, you're rehabbing the property to increase the value of the property um, you're refinancing the property at the new value and then you can pull money out of it. Um, you can rent it out and then you take that money and go repeat it. It's a really good, it's, it's hard to do right now when you think there's going to be a dip because it's, it's part of a flip, but it's an amazing way to go to get to speed to the market and just keep and keep getting in where you can pull your money back out of a deal. So yeah. For, for, it's hard for brand new investors, I'd say, because it, it requires a lot of cash up front, sure. but it's, it's a great way to get cash back right away. Not right away, but um, no. But so you're right another, because you can you can, you know, say your investment is a hundred thousand dollars, whether it's you and a partner, just just to keep numbers around, right? You pay the pay for it cash. If you refinance and the house value is now one fifty, and you refinance a hundred thousand, now you didn't, you know, maybe your whole cost was a hundred thousand. You refinanced your hundred. You didn't spend a dollar. Yep. And now you have a property that's giving you cash flow. And now you have a property that you can sell one day. And like you guys talked about before, hopefully it appreciates. So it's going to take like a little bit of, of patience and work and luck and all these little things coming together, but you could essentially buy a place for nothing if it's done, you know, in, in the, in a, the right way. Yeah. Right. I'd say, so we have a lot of like younger, I would say listeners too. And, and I think they love hearing the stories, but also, I think it would be cool to go into like for you, what are some of the resources that you've used that have helped you along in your journey um, that some other people might be able to take advantage of? I mean, it, I'm not, I don't, like I said, I don't know how to read. So I'm not, <laughs> I don't read a lot of books. I, I, I listen to podcasts, but I mean, my mom has taught me a lot. My dad has taught me about, he's a freak numbers guy. So he, he, you know, he's big with the numbers. My mom's all about the risk and the real estate. And then, you know, they have people in real estate that they're buddies with. I do uh, lessons for kids that their parents are real estate agents. And we end up talking for 30, 45 minutes after each lesson because I'm just picking their brains. Yeah. Right. So the, I think the biggest educational tool that you can have is the people around you, which is incredible because this is exactly what it is. And that's not, you know, a quick, ad for you guys or anything like that but it's the truth like where are you really going to learn you can sit there and you can read a book but you, you need to hear the stories you need to hear the experiences you need to hear the highs the lows and then you need to do the experiences you have to go through it to understand it if you just sit there and talk about it all day you're never gonna you're you're not gonna learn right yep. i can't think of how many times i'm like i'm flipping a property i'm flipping a property right but, you know, it's just because I watched HG, HGTV for three hours. Like, that's all it is. It's just in my head right now. But I know that if I went through the process of it, I'd learn so much 
because I realized the mistakes I made. I know what I would do differently. And that's, that's where you're going to learn. So, so right to answer your question. I mean, there's, like I said, I've been lucky. I'm, my mom's dad like forced real estate on her in, in the mindset. Like she was told never rent, never rent. She bought her first home and my dad moved in to her home. Like it's just, it's a mentality that we have from the beginning. Yeah, Larry, you've been, you say you've been lucky too, but think about this. You got into, you learned how to be a landlord organically, right? So all those things, and like maybe you can contribute it to luck, but what I'm saying is all those things that is going to help you manage maybe an apartment complex one day or 15 units one day, you did it when you were in college or just out of college. So you were managing tenants already. You learned like, how do you write leases? Like, how do you get payments on time? Do you work with tenants? What are the maintenance requests like? So all of those things, just by house hacking and getting in early, you're like up and running with that. So that, I mean, that's an invaluable experience, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, the, the mistakes made the past 10 years since the first property was, was bought. Yeah. That like, we wore a lot of bruises. We've walked into a place before where there was mold on the carpet because, you know, they just didn't take care of it. And sure. it was, you know, we didn't do a good job of making sure that the property was managed correctly. Um, we've had tenants that just flat out haven't paid and we kind of handcuffed ourselves there. And, and, you know, whether we get all the money or a little bit of the money or didn't get the late fee money. Yeah. I mean, that's what's taught me. And I mean, you know, the, the learning how to be a landlord, it's just, you know, it's just not being an ass, right? Like, yeah. But now you know what to do and what not to do. That's a hundred percent. But right? like, it's, it's, it's funny because like, I think it was right. You were talking about in one of the first episodes, you said like, we're trying to figure out like what the next thing is. Like we'd sit at home, like after a night out and we want to like figure out how we're going to make money, how we're going to do the next big thing. And I remember th thinking that I can think of the conversations right now, <laughs> but then it like dawned on me one day. I'm like, I don't have to be, you know, creating the next Facebook. I just have to do, what everybody else does better. And then that, that's it. Like I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm buying property right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, bu I'm <laughs> buying properties yeah. with my parents and I'm trying to be the best landlord that I can so that, you know, maybe they'll refer me and then it's less work. And then as far as a hockey coach, you know, it's a snaky business in the youth hockey world. I could tell you that for free. And you know, all I got to do is not be a snake, be an honest guy. And, and, truly care about the kids, which I really do. It's a passion of mine and everything will take care of itself. As long as I work hard, you know, that's it. I don't need to be figuring out the next greatest thing. Just put my head down and do it better than the guy next to me. They say service, you know, always service a business as opposed to, to sell a business, right? Like service over sales. Um, it helps in the long run. So I, I think about the hockey business, like you said, you were upfront about it, but also, I don't know if you can explain the difference, but you talked about primarily having college students as tenants and Corey has, you know, like families essentially. So maybe you guys could go into the differences of working with the two and what like the pros are versus the cons. Yeah. I mean, I can start out like a little bit. I was actually going to talk about this in, a, in another episode. We're going to do an entire episode on uh, managing tenants and like how to write leases and, and that type of thing. But it's uh it's during this time i can just relate to an experience i just had having like just having compassion for people and what they're going through right now has carried me personally through getting paid full rent during a time where people are not paying rent to their landlords and i i call you know i called them to ask how they were doing not asking where the rent was and like that's one example um i have in my duplex in new jersey i have you know, two families that have kids and uh, one of them still working, which is great. I was happy to hear that one of them lost their job. And they've just, the fact that I called and had compassion and said, is there anything I can do? And I ended up sending them the information on how to apply to get the stimulus check or not the stimulus check, but for the unemployment and how you were going to get, um, you know, more money. And they were so thankful. I mean, and they sent the, the rent late. I waived the, the late fees, but I said, you know what, it, it's more important to just be a good person right now. Um, ordinarily, I would be I would be strict about it because it is a business. But um, that's just a little bit of the things that I've seen lately that is really helping me through. I, I guess Larry managing, 
you know, managing college students could be a little bit different. I, I think it's a good question, Ryan. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's funny. I mean, you know, we were all one of those college students not too long ago. So, you know, horror stories that you can think of as being a landlord, you probably were on the other end of it when you were in college, right? Dude, That's dude. why you fear it because you know what you did. But um, I'm lucky. We, we have great tenants. I actually, I'm, I'm the coach of the hockey team. So a couple of the tenants come from there. So I just tell the boys, I say, you, you throw a party and the cops get called, we'll just run 6 a.m. the next day. Like, you know, so that's, oh, that's something that tool for you. Like you bring kids that you coach, right. To live there. Right? That's yeah, awesome. I give them first. I say, you guys tell me what apartments you guys want and they're yours. Like that's a plus side to being on the hockey team here. But you know, it's, it's also helped me in the sense that I can kind of always keep an eye on, on my tenants and, and stuff like that. Because, you know, I remember being in college, our coach was the last one to know about it after the school found out. Right. I know about it because the cops get called and, and I get an email to, to me saying that this unit had a party. So they know going to bed if they did something wrong that they're waking up to a phone call from me. Right. right? So that's a unique situation. But um, there's other, you know, there's, it's, it's funny that you said, you know, being compassionate and stuff because, you know, there's this weird feeling that your landlord is supposed to be an ass, right? Like he's supposed 100%. to be, or she's supposed to be like, just not friendly, doesn't care about you. Wants All about the, money, right? Wants the money on the first, won't fix anything. There's this whole like feeling when you, when you, when you say the word landlord, right? And, and talking about doing things better, I, I thought to myself, because I thought that that's what I had to be when I was first a landlord, like my, my friends that were like two days late on rent because they just forgot to text their mom because they got, you know, hammered the night before for the rent check. Uh, and I was like, you need to get the rent on. And I'm like, who the, what am I doing? Like, yeah. I, you know, like why that's not going to get anything. So, right. you know, the more I realized that there's this weird niche in this market where if you're just a nice guy as a landlord, you don't hear that too often. Like how many times do you hear like, Oh, my landlord's a great guy. Yeah. Oh, no, landlord. it's so true, Larry. I think uh, uh, just to go off what you're saying, I think one of the things is like, there's a big difference between being the nice guy and letting everything slide and being, and having rules that people need to follow because you do run a business but then also looking at the humanity aspect of it. So what I'm, what I was relating it to is like the whole COVID situation right now. But I would say that, you know, for listeners, having a, a system that rent is due on the first, you have a five day grace period, and then holding your tenants accountable and saying, I am going to charge you to uh, late fees and I am going to do these things, but doing it in a way that's like, look, I'm just running a business and you yeah. know, also being a nice person, right? Exactly. And, and, and that's like that tough part where, I, I'll attribute that to, you know, my dad, he's a salesman and like the thousands of phone calls that I've heard him deal with problems or people not getting something done the way that he needs to get done. But you know, he can't snap on them like the way that he talks and then he hangs up the phone and he snaps on me, which is fine because it's not costing him any money. Right. Yeah. So it's like you learn to, to, you know, fake it. And that was one of the big things. I actually went back and, and guest spoke in one of my professor's classes and I said, I was like, listen, I wasn't the best student. Like, and you know, I graduated and I come back and they tell me that I was a good student. I go, I don't know what you're talking about. And the professor in the back, he's like, well, you faked it and you were good at it. And that's part of business. And he's right. Like fake it till you make it sort of thing. It's true. And it does hold value in the business world. So, um, you know, you just, the whole thought to me of, of, you know, being pissed at somebody cause they can't get their rent or something like there's so many things going on today and stuff like if you're the nice landlord that's going to go so far you know if you're if you're new to this it's it's huge kindness is going to be the new cool coming up here yeah absolutely heard it here first i think gary v said it but that yeah yeah you uh, who's that yeah i don't know that guy. <laughs> um but i think both kind of to both of your points is you're in the people business right and relationships at the end of the day people are more inclined to buy from you stay with you as a, as a client or as a, as a tenant, if they know you in some sort of respect, like if it's just some random guy that's charging my rent every month, I'm not going to, okay, if something happens, like you just kind of, it's almost like a robot, but if they know like Corey or Larry is my guy, like, especially you, you talked about your, your um, team or teammates and the kids. Uh, I, if it was you and I knew you own the place, 
I would not trash it. I wouldn't want to. I'd be like, yeah, exactly. It just, you feel a type of way about respect it. Respect level. Take care of it. Yeah, exactly. And and that's what it is. It's creating that 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 level of respect. And you know, uh, I forget exactly how you put it. You said service. How did you put it? Service the business or um, just focus focus on. It's not always about the sale. It's about about the service and taking care of people. Yeah, like the sales will take care of themselves if you take care of the service, which you can control, right? So it's, it's with anything like my hockey business, as long as I'm connecting with the individual kid and then with the parent asking them and then remembering, you know, what, uh, you know, we talked about the week or two weeks prior before that connection, you know, that's what's huge. I mean, I, I got parents asking me to FaceTime their 12 year olds to ask them how they're doing. Like I would have never have thought that parents want that, but you know, I'm, I'm, I love it. And, you know, one of those kids from a week ago that I called texted me today and said, Hey coach. And then I talked to his dad and I was like, Hey, um, you know, he, you know, your son texted me today. And he's like, Oh really? I didn't tell him to text you. Like yeah. those cool little things. Like that's awesome. That's why I coach. And that's, I think why I've been able to be successful is because I've created these relationships and everything else just, it, it, it falls in the form from there. The referrals, they come because people want to help you. People want to continue to do business with you. And they know that you need to be successful to keep doing your business. So they do that for you. It's not hard. Yeah. I'm not a smart guy. I don't really have any clue on what I'm doing until I'm actually in it. So if I can do these things, anybody can. As sad as, you know, I don't want to not. So funny, man, because but... Rye, you talked about how we're, the podcast is like an unconventional way to network. And, and this whole conversation is it happened out of an organic way to network. And what Larry's talking about, your network it's not like putting on a suit and tie necessarily and going to a networking meeting and handing out business cards right like that's like that makes my skin crawl and sometimes i have to do that stuff for work but it's like how do you create the network where people want to come to you and you're just it starts out with being that nice person that people want to do business with um i think we have time here for a couple more questions uh i know maybe rye has a couple more i have one that i wanted to focus on specifically because of just the nature of our show and I, I want to know, Larry, what, you know, what makes you most happy in this world and what are, what are things that you're doing daily uh, to create that happiness level to, you know, in your life? Well, um, the thing that makes me the most happy is about three feet tall and he's a rug rat <laughs> and he's uh, his name is LJ. So um, he, and especially with this quarantine, like, I have parents that text me and, and when I say parents, I mean like the kids that I coach, their, their parents, how you holding up? How's everything going? Are you okay? Do you need anything? And they're unbelievable. I love those texts. It makes me feel like people care, but I'm like, I'm great. I'm spending every minute of every day with my son and I know I'll never get this back. And yeah. you know, my girlfriend, Jess, she's pregnant right now. You know, awesome. I, the fact, thank you. The fact that we're, you know, still breathing how many days in the quarantine with uh, you know, 20 month old and a pregnant girlfriend. Like this is just, we're, that's shit. We I should get some, and managing a business. Or yeah. Just, we should get some sort of award here, um, but as, as a lot of people should. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what makes me happy. And the fact that my, my job, my school and real estate allows me to, and I do get a lot of time with LJ. We don't have daycare. We don't, we, we balance our schedules. So there's a cost that most people face that we don't have to worry about. So that freedom to be able to manipulate my schedule and be able to wake, wake up with him on a Tuesday when maybe other dads are, are off the work or, you know, put him to sleep on the Wednesday when other dads are, you know, working late. Like, there's always times like I'm traveling for, you know, the college team or I'm working late at the rink and I don't get to put him to sleep, but you know, to wake him up from his midday nap, not, not too many dads get to do that. So, you know, my love in life is, is 100% them. And, you know, because of my freedom with my school and, and the real estate, it gives me even more time to do what I love and it's spending time with them. It's awesome. Right. Do you have anything else before we, uh, wrap this up here. I think, I mean, that some of the stuff you're talking about is just like exactly what we embody, just listening to people loving their life and have, and, and doing it through, you know, trying to create this financial independence for them. You got anything else, Ry? No, I just, I think he, Larry tied that in perfectly. You know, we talk about how time is the most valuable asset, right. And things you can't get back and tie, tying your business 
as well as real estate into spending more time with your, your kid and your family and your, your happiness. I think that's perfect. Um, and also I just think you, we also touched on the unconventional way of networking this episode. It's perfect. I'm just so pumped that we had you on and pumped that you listened. And, uh, if we can help you in any way along the way, um, please let us know. But I think also it's important for people that are listening. They're probably going to want to get to know you a little bit too, and maybe network with you on the side. What's the best way they can reach out to you? Um, I mean, DMs, I guess, getting slid into them are cool, right, Core? Um, that's all. <laughs> bro, I, bro um, I, I'm wrapped up, right? I mean, not wrapped up. I got a girl. My DMs, well, <laughs> my DMs are not too busy. Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, you can, you can, I, you can email me lab5531 at gmail.com. I literally took my PSU email account. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like a boss. Big. Uh, yeah. 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 So, and then I have go hard hockey at gmail.com too. So go um, hard hockey. At yeah. Gmail. That's so I got to explain that. So a lot of people are like, go hard. Like uh, that's kind of weird. And I'm like, I, I get that. Like, I understand what you're thinking, but the way that I played the game was 1000% all the time. Like mm-hmm. there was no second off. You didn't waste a second. And you know, my nickname was your Johnny go hard. Like that was, you know, a hockey term that got thrown around or Tommy try hard. So <laughs> we came up with like a, we were joining the summer league and I was like, well, you know, I'm like, I was like, I want to name us the Johnny go hards. Cause we're a bunch of club guys that were playing like professional and NCAA guys that were really good at hockey. And we weren't. So we're the only way we're going to win this is if we work our asses off in a summer league. So we're the Johnny go hards. And then that summer, I was like, I'm starting my own hockey school. And it just kind of all evolved from the fact that, you know, I was getting what we call chirped in the locker room for being a go hard. So that's where that name stemmed from. And, um, you know, it's like I said, some people are like, that's kind of a weird name. And I'm like, well, I'm proud of it because yeah. it, no, it I like it, man. I, I think, want. um, I think, you know, just for other people listening, like, uh, you know, I can speak for the situation here. The way Larry and I reconnected is pretty awesome. Uh, he's a great guy and he seems to be running a really a good business. So if there's any kids who are into hockey um, within the Chester County or is it Berks? Are you yeah. So, so I do a lot of my work up at Berks County, but I'm all over and, and I, I got some stuff that's in the works that be pretty monumental. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll I'll check say, back with you on it. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. I can come on and, and talk about that. Cause that's a whole nother platform I'm excited for. And, and this time's allowed us to get ready for it. So. Hopefully that becomes public soon. That news. Well, with that, I'd say Johnny, go hard or go home. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. This episode like of that. the Weekly Juice. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate you. Uh, thanks for coming on, bud. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.